First, hi everyone, I'm Arun Kumar. I'm an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego, and I'm joining virtually from San Diego. I guess should we call out the next person's name <laughs> to make sure it progresses promptly? Still with uh, Parama. Hi all, I'm Paroma. I'm joining virtually from the Bay Area. I'm currently a co-founder at uh, Snorkel AI, which is a startup. And previously I got my PhD from Stanford, also on snorkel related stuff. So you get to name the next person. <laughs> Let's do <Okay>. all this. <laughs> um, Matei next. Uh, hi, I'm Matei. Um, I'm also in the Bay Area right now. Didn't uh, make it to Copenhagen, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I, I split my time between Stanford and uh, Databricks. Um, maybe, sir, you want to go next? Hi, everyone. So I'm a assistant professor at ETH Zurich, calling in from Zurich. My group work on machine learning systems. Uh, I think Carlo. Yeah. Hey, I'm Carlo. I uh, lead the Gray Systems Lab at Microsoft. It's an applied research group. And lately, we're doing a lot of uh, systems for ML and ML for systems work. Uh, let's say Vraj. Okay, I guess we're doing everybody then. It's a round table. Okay. Right. <laughs> no, that's okay. It, it, uh, Arun, why don't you give, give the order, right? So you. Okay, fine. Context. So let's finish the panelists. Um, Sebastian. Hi, I'm Sebastian. I'm an assistant professor from the University of Amsterdam, and I'm also joining virtually from Amsterdam. You're joining virtually from Amsterdam. So that's not your real canal in the background. <laughs> Unfortunately not. <laughs> Matthias. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm a professor for data management and machine learning systems at Steel Kratz, and I'm actually in my hotel room here in Copenhagen, which is a great uh, hybrid event so far, actually. and. Uh, yeah, um, maybe you have Jun, do you want to go next? Thank you. Uh, so I'm Jun Yan, and I'm a professor at uh, Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. So I'm joining virtually from Durham, North Carolina. And this background is actually my building. <laughs> um, Arun, back to you. Uh, hey, did we miss somebody? Oh, yeah. Chris. Chris. <laughs> Chris. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Chris Germain. I'm at Rice University um, in Houston, Texas, where it's rainy and tropical right now. Really? Tropical in Houston? <laughs> Let's just say it's a little humid right now. Got it. Okay. So we have more folks joining. So this is a round table. Folks are just welcome, everyone. Anybody can uh, speak and ask questions or pitch in with comments. Now, for the people um, who just joined the panelists, we just did a round of introductions. The uh, other attendees, when you're speaking or when you're asking a question, it would be great if you could introduce yourself too. Maybe we could just dive into the questions given that we have only one hour. Chris, what do you think? Okay. And then uh, anybody who wants to speak up, just if you're speaking for the first time, just introduce yourself, your name and where you are at and where you are working, that sort of stuff. Um, this round table is meant to be just an informal catch-up session for folks interested in systems for ML related research in the database community. And as we know, this has become a huge topic now um, over the last half a decade or so, it's really expanded dramatically. And I think uh, Sebastian organized this team workshop, right? From the beginning, Sigma 2016 onwards, it was really nice place to meet up and chit chat. I don't think VLDB has anything equivalent to that. We have only the Sigma team workshop, but this is a nice opportunity to catch up and just to see how the field is, how this area is evolving and uh, where the frontiers of research are, what we can do more as a, an area within this community. Um, so I guess the round table format is pretty informal. You'll just ask two very standard questions about research in the space, about what more can we do for amplifying our impact and we'll ask the panelists to pitch in and chit chat and discuss. And everybody else is welcome to pitch in as well to ask questions or add points. And uh, let's start with that then. So the first question was, what do you think are the biggest research opportunities cutting kind of uh, research questions that are critical for this area within the data management community? 
anybody who wants to go first, feel free to speak up. I think we have 34 participants now. I don't think that's super big. Maybe we don't need to do the raise hands thing. Chris, what do you think? I think people can probably just speak up when they want to talk. Okay. If we hear too much crosstalk and people kind of interrupting too much, then we can enforce a raise hand first and then we'll call out your name. But uh, panelists, feel free to pitch in and kind of share your thoughts on what you think are the biggest, most critical research questions for this area in this community. I can share a few thoughts. Um, so today, uh, Tim Kraska actually gave his, uh, gave his keynote and uh, mentioned specialization, for instance, optimized databases. And I actually see a similar trend here for machine learning systems in the sense of specialization across the entire stack. Really, that starts at the hardware where you have more GPUs, FPGAs, and really mixtures. And it's about full utilization of all those devices and not just coarse cranes executed here or there, but really partitioning data appropriately and then task placement accordingly that you fully utilize all the available hardware that you have to your disposal. And then it moves really up the stack that you get larger levels of composite kind of machine learning pipelines that have additional outer loops for hyperparameter tuning, data augmentation wrapped around them, which inevitable leads to a redundancy. And it's about data organization, specializing the data structures, compression, uh, removing unnecessary redundancy. And then we go again up the stack to data engineering and data platforms, where it's about specializing to deployments that can be federated learning, cloud uh, that can be a, a so, so serverless and all those new things that essentially come up and where it's worthwhile to actually explore if it makes sense to, to use machine learning or adapt machine learning systems for it. And then data engineering. So we see a little bit more specialization toward individual use cases that can be data formats, that can be the kinds of data pre-processing they're doing. So for me, at least for the next five years, it's about across the entire stack from hardware to the applications about specializing. We are now at the point where pretty much every company does some form of data science pipelines, machine learning. So the easy low hanging fruit, fruits are kind of away. And now it's about getting more concrete and specializing to the individual fields. That's at least my view. This of course is super high level and it touches upon many works that many on this panel are actually doing. So. Interesting, that's, that's very cool. It's going to be a Cambrian explosion of systems and problems. Let, let, me, try, let me try to counter that Arun, if, if I may. Um, so first of all, Matthias, let me start with you know, parenthesis, I agree. This is a lot of very good things, but now I'm going to disagree with you. Uh, okay. For the sake of, uh, you know, spicing up a little mm -hmm. bit the panel. Um, I, I think there's been a lot of motion towards sort of building the best model, going as fast as we can, right? These are things that we are super good at, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, give us a benchmark, we're gonna, we're gonna build a system that goes faster than that benchmark, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the, in practice, the majority of projects fails on much more trivial things, right? How do I access my data? How do I deploy these things twice in a row without breaking in the middle, making sure I can track things, right? I know Matei and Sale are, 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 are some of the many people that are looking at some of this problem. So I feel like the, the most glaring gap right now in, at least in the practice of, 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 of this is that we have a collection of beautiful silos, right? We have the fastest possible way of training this model. And then there's a giant gap from there to using the model, or there's a giant gap to get to the data. And in particular to me as a, as a database community, I think mm -hmm. our, our, our job is to get data science and, and manage data to, to come closer together, right? One of the beautiful things of a database is it's a one-stop shop for your data. It keeps your data safe. You can ask your query declaratively. Everything is sort of very self-contained. You know, there's like, whatever, 5 million certifications that, you know, the big commercial databases have to make sure your data respect every law in, in, on the planet, right? We don't have any of that for data science. Right now, uh, you know, you do all of this for your most important data. Then you take your data, you plop it off in a CSV, you send it off on someone's laptop, you muck around with, you know, libraries that probably you don't even have the right licenses on and they're, you know, they could be full of, of, of bugs or issues and there's like one person maintaining them. And then you take these things back, you plop it in a container, you drop it in some other infrastructure is not maintained and, and things break, right? And this is not enterprise grade. So I think my pitch for the community is we need to go towards an enterprise grade machine learning 
as data people, as database people, we have done this. We have 40 years of history on keeping your data secure, making it run end to end simplified experiences, right? So all of the specialization you describe, I think is absolutely vital, but need to be hidden. I don't want to know what you're doing. Absolutely. All hiding need to be a one-stop shop for me as a database, because obviously, you know, I've, I've come with huge biases towards everything should go in the database eventually. Uh, obviously there are other ways, other solutions to the problem, but I think, I think going in that direction is, it, it's pretty big. Absolutely. I would even turn this around of saying um, additional specialization without the necessary abstractions can be hurtful because it really decreases productivity. Uh, but at one point, performance is a means of productivity too. Uh, if a person actually has to wait for a week, that completely disrupts their the processes. I've seen it at IBM where uh, the usual measure was, does it run in the night or not? Uh, so it doesn't matter if it's four hours or eight hours, but if it's 24 hours, that really matters because it gets a day out of their normal workflow and they, they operate with. Uh, and maybe one thing, and uh, probably we are agreeing there, but just to raise it again um, and counter it, re-counter it, um, one trend we are seeing, and Microsoft is uh, actively involved with Hummingbird, is that many of those pre-processing tasks, model debugging and things, can actually be mapped down to very clean linear algebra matrix formulations in order to exploit this entire host. In that case, you can make a case, an argument that all the performance optimizations we're doing for training, ultimately, if you're, I mean, it's painful to map those algorithms into vectorized kind of array operations, but once you have it there, you have this benefit of potential and really leveraging this entire host of hardware acceleration, parallelization and things. That's much easier on a matrix multiply than on a tree structure. Yeah. And in fact, we're trying to do the same for relational operators too. So we're taking joins and saying, can I map them down to, to a tensor operation? Right. There's some initial result that look look somewhat positive, right? I don't I don't think it's gonna work in all cases, but there's some intriguing stuff there. Okay. It is coming up at VDP here. So yes. <laughs> the story of data land is it's gonna be heterogeneous. I don't think one size will fit all. And you will have companies that can afford giant engineering teams will specialize. And there are small and medium enterprises who want somebody else to build the software for them. They will go to the Microsofts and the Oracles and the Amazons of the world to get the products. So I think it's going to be a mix. Um, Mate, Paroma, you have companies, Paroma, your company just raised a what, billion bucks or valued at billion bucks, congratulations. And Mate, I'm hearing again and again that Databricks is going public later this year. I don't know if that's happening. What, what do you folks think? What is going to happen in this space? What's the biggest research challenges? Um, no, first of all, thank you so much. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think I agree with both what Mateus and Carlos were saying. Um, I think coming more from a machine learning rather than database perspective, I am such a huge fan of the idea that there's so much data, right? It's, it's kind of become a common thing for all companies. Everyone wants to do machine learning and data science, but the versioning, debugging, and all those challenges associated with the data there's no system around that, right? It's it's always done kind of piecemeal in a one-off manner. So going from there to taking advantage of, you know, all the state-of-the-art models and the fastest model ever in machine learning, that gap is still there. I'm coming from a biased perspective, of course, saying that we, we kind of need to think in this data-centric manner, make sure that's kind of at the center of the process, avoid those, you know, one week, two week delays that we have right now, just preparing our data, kind of, you know, not thinking about the end goal here and making it all part of um, a one loop. So I feel like I've agreed with both Matthias and Carlos, not, not injecting too much spice into this conversation here. Um, but yeah, definitely coming from the machine learning perspective, data is just so, so critical to getting to success here. And there's so much work that's already been done in the database research, and it's just about applying that and repeating it here. Yeah, I, I think what everyone said makes a lot of sense. Uh, definitely the data management is important and uh, integrating this with the systems that do the data processing. I'll mention two kind of two things I, I've seen that might be sort of interesting. So one thing is in the industry side, right? What do the teams that use ML really worry about and so on, you know, at least the ones we talk with. Basically what I've seen is in all these teams, you know, a company hires machine learning people, they have an initial application, they work really hard, they get the data and they get the ML in and they do it. 
And then they, you know, and then they say, well, we have this team, let's do more ML now that we've built this expertise. But they realize they actually have to spend like half their time just maintaining and babysitting the old application because things will break over time. And so what they really want is a way, you know, much like productionizing, you know, a software service or even like a, you know, data, like an ETL job in your database, they want a way to set it up and have it run by itself without human intervention if possible and then move on to implement the next 10 20 applications and have them all on reliably as well and like or, or alert if something goes wrong so i think this is this is an interesting thing is how do you turn it into something that you know once it's running you don't have to babysit it and spend half your time maintaining it and those people can actually add net new uh products in that company um, so I think things like monitoring are important, automatic, you know, rollback and fixes and anything you can do to, you know, like in software, anything you can do to like catch an incident and ideally to, to figure out ways to fix it. Um, so it's an interesting thing. I think as a researcher, you can, you know, you can try doing this with um, maybe if you have a data set where you've gotten stuff over time or uh, you, you check for drift. Um, and then the other thing that relates to this, but that we're doing on the research side is, um, I think there's a really interesting question. Like now a lot of the systems work is saying, okay, the ML algorithms are given, like we opened Wikipedia and read them and let's build a system that makes them good. But I think you can also change some of the algorithms and models to be more operable and more systems friendly. Um, so that's a really interesting thing you can do. One example we've been doing uh, in my group is instead of these giant language models like GPT-3 that try to answer questions, we have this retrieval um, approach where like you have a small model and you have a collection of text like Wikipedia and the model searches it when answering a question. And this gives you really powerful things. Like if there's a bug, if there's a mistake in some of your text, you just fix that one document. Uh, you don't have to like spend three months to retrain GPT-3 to get your app to output the right thing. So, I mean, that's like a small example. We're not, you know, we're not even the ones to invent this. We're just exploring ways to do this better. But I think this trend of like, let's rethink ML to make it easier to maintain is is interesting. Got it. Interesting, that's a whole swath of topics on data-centric ML and ML monitoring and maintenance. So do you want to jump in here? You've been doing a bunch of stuff with your EaseML on CI and CD workflows for Kind of maintenance of ml software oh sure of course of course yeah so let me add like two things right so i would totally agree all the things we talk about that kind of really emerging challenges let me add two things um i mean not really about the challenges but the things that bothers me about our own work that i don't know how to solve right so the first thing is about we whenever we talk about data management for machine learning right so we think about machine learning as a operator a processing as uh, like over the data Right. So, and we understand that process like 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 a lot now, right? So we understand how to optimize it and uh, to some extent how to manage it. So, for example, like uh, like I don't know your like amazing work about learning over group, right? How can you optimize the whole thing end to end? Right, Masset has a system ML system DS, right? So one thing that uh, I feel that's interesting down the road is at least myself don't understand how to think about data for machine learning at a logical level. So what's that? Right? What's the data processing pipeline? What is data for machine learning? Right? Back to data management, we used to have this beautiful abstraction about the, 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 the connection between the relational model and the mathematical logic. There's a finite model theory, right? So there's all the different ways to analyze your query over your data. So I personally feel we are kind of missing that component, and I have no idea what that is. Right? So the second thing I think uh, I totally agree with what Matei said, right? So essentially, yeah, kind of a little bit of triangle, like there are three different corners. There's a machine learning algorithm. There's our own data ecosystems, like database, Spark, so on and so forth. And then there's emergent hardware, right? How can you co-design given these three different aspects? I think that's also very interesting. Yeah, again, that's my biased view on the challenges. Yeah. Sounds pretty ambitious though. So um, about this retrospective, everybody keeps talking database system, database system, Jun. What's your take on this? A decade ago, you worked on Riot DB. I don't know if you were at Cider, was it earlier this year, where people were now saying, we're going to scale pandas, we're going to do data frames. And I was like, people, a decade ago, people did that for R. And we ran into some bottlenecks when 
Turing complete code was injected alongside matrix operations and data frame operations. Why do you think things are going to be different with pandas and stuff now? Nobody had an answer, John. You have long experience <laughs> with data frames and matrices and scalability and stuff like that. Where do you think the Python land is going? Is that a big research area for the data community to study more? Very interesting question. Um, you know, to some extent, I think there are things that we cannot control, right? So in terms of like which particular language framework, uh, you know, really becomes popular, there are some market forces that that's much larger. Um, but uh, what I like about, I, I think, you know, coming back to uh, what, what Che talked about um, just, just earlier, right? So if we can come up with a set of abstractions that's really at, at the core of uh, uh, doing you know, data-driven machine learning, you know, what exactly is that set of abstractions? Now, if you talk about, like, say, for example, uh, database management, we, we know, right? We know these are the fundamental operators, you know, no matter in what incarnation it is. It, it could be coded up as, uh, you know, data frames in R, it could be coded in data frames in Spark. Um, it could be, you know, this combination of those operators in a different language, but it comes down to these primitives and we understand them really well. Um, the question is, how do we, do this for uh, machine learning. So, so in some sense, I, I like to argue for, uh, you know, doing research that looks beyond particular, you know, waves of languages and so on, and really find that the right abstraction. Uh, but I actually want to push this a little further because I think in terms of computational aspect, um, I would say that, you know, we've, we've made a lot of progress over the years, right? We, we kind of know these are, for example, you know, linear algebra, it, it tend to be used quite a bit, right? And, but there is the other aspect of data management. Um, I would say maybe the data integration folks have worked on uh, quite a bit, but, but I think it's increasingly become the issue for me when working with these machine learning systems. It's because you know, sometimes you've got to look beyond just what you have, right? Look beyond the pipeline, the data. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, first of all, um, you know, how do you, so, so we, we always, with database people, right, we always have this closed world assumption, like data is, I mean, data is all there is. We have the data and that's the whole truth, right? But the reality is much more nuanced than that, right? So going sort of one step beyond that and figuring out, you know, what are the complexity outside of what we are able to capture, right? So is this pattern I'm seeing, for example, in the data, is actually due to a change in the reporting procedure <laughs> introduced in one year? And if I know that, how do I, you know, incorporate that in my analysis? I have no idea. I don't even know how to express that, let alone how that can be incorporated in my analysis. Uh, as another example, uh, right, maybe you use this data for your decision making, you collect this particular metric uh, just because of it's convenient to, to collect, right? But is that the right surrogate to use, right? If you use, say, for example, exam scores or GPAs for student or learning outcome, and if you're not careful, there are ways to introduce biases and errors to creep in. So I guess this question involves like, is there any way to kind of document this knowledge and organize it in some way such that we um, we can also leverage this uh, this this body of knowledge in building more systems that's uh, that's a little harder for you to shoot yourself in the in the feet with, right? So I, I guess I I I think I um, remember the word hiding earlier. Right. And that's what we are very good at. We hide a complexity. But in some sense, I think there is an argument for not hiding the complexity sometimes because data analysis is actually pretty serious and, and shouldn't trivialize it. Right. Things are so easy. You plug this in, you, you know, you click some buttons, some numbers will always come out of it. But can you trust that conclusion? So I wonder if there's anything that's more formal and, uh, uh, you know, maybe we as a community can also provide to help, you know, describe what are those pitfalls and, and how we can avoid them and incorporate them into the systems. Yeah, I just want to kind of jump off of that point. And this also goes back to the point that was made earlier around monitoring, right? Um, I think it's really easy. And I feel like I, I did this when I was back in grad school. So maybe a little bit of self-reflection here. It's easy to make these systems that are completely automated, right? And then they, they'll they provide you a number. They'll say, hey, I automatically, you know, cleaned your data, um, retrained your model, got you this high score. But I think 
not having the human element in it, right? I feel like we lose a lot there. Um, you need that domain expertise to be able to tell like exactly, you know, what is this pattern that has emerged and where is it coming from? It's really hard to do all of that in an automated way and still have like 100% trust. So I think, you know, moving towards systems, moving towards models and algorithms where you're not taking the human out of the loop and automating the entire process, rather you're trying to use the human expertise as efficiently as possible to kind of decode these patterns, help with denoising, help understand, you know, why your model started performing really badly all of a sudden. I think that's the key, efficiently using human time rather than trying to take the human out of the loop completely. Um, so definitely wanted to plus one that explicitly. That's, that's a very important direction, right? Understanding how do we rein in this complexity of uh, tasks that is very hard to automate, especially on tabular data. So I work on data prep a lot, right? Automated data prep, I collaborate with Amazon and Google and stuff. A lot of that stuff is still very manual. And uh, the sourcing part of the data, stitching things together is still manual, especially on anything that relates to anything remotely related to structured data. Images, fine, audio, fine, text, even not that bad. But structured data, it's just a mess. So Sebastian, you straddled both industry and you came back to academia against your good judgment. <laughs> I so, still work one one day for for a retail corporation here, so I still have one. For one of those minutes. rare examples who Amazon failed to gobble fully. So, what is your take on this when you've seen both sides? Um. So I think um, I think everything that has been mentioned are very good points. Um, I would support the view that um, like ensuring the correctness of of machine learning applications is a very very difficult thing. Um, I see this with data scientists that we hire and educate that for them, it's really, really difficult to, um, to ensure that their, um, that their machine learning models really work correctly. Um, and I think the situation will also become much more difficult in the future because um, um, we will have more regula regulation. And um, even with GDPR, really simple things like um, deciding whether a certain record has been used as the training data for a model or whether a certain attribute has been used for, uh, in the training data of a model. That sounds simple, but um, in my experience in industry deployments, the, these are really, really difficult questions. Um, and I think then another angle that hasn't been mentioned is also making sure that these systems behave responsibly. And I think that's also um, very much connected to, um, um, to compliance. And I think I would agree with, with say, I think what's missing is, um, um, some kind of, of abstraction or some kind of view that um, um, looks at more than just some input data in a single table form that is feed to a model. I think we need to take a broader view and need to think more about pipelines that um, feed training data to models and that also work with, with multiple inputs. And I think we have many small solutions, but um, it's very difficult to do something that works across the whole pipeline. Anybody else wants to pitch to respond to that? There's some chat going on here, so. Maybe I might take one comment. Yes, go for it. There was a second voice, but um, uh, so earlier we talked about fully automating the pipeline and how, how difficult it is. And now Sebastian with data validation and ensuring correctness and other uh, metrics actually along the, the and it's increasingly becomes very, very difficult. Um, and one paper that I mentioned in our data integration lecture and course uh, is an early paper from 2007 from, from Fu Brunstein actually on model management back in the schema matching days. And it's draw a very negative uh, conclusion saying, we work 10 years on it, why isn't this space doesn't look any better than 10 years ago? And it was the conclu conclusion that, well, this space is super messy and uh, it's so nuanced often, uh, but in order to automatically generate a mapping that actually is a transformation program, it needs to be precisely engineered and everything needs to fit together. Otherwise it will simply not work. And uh, so not aiming for full automation, but building rather tools that guide this process. So like Sebastian had a library for data validation that creates common terminology and can be used consistently, but still kind of is a tool to be used. So instead of just building this one API and we optimize everything underneath, it's 
so it's different abstractions and tools that augment kind of the workflow. I, I think you have a very good point there. And and, and jumping off also of some of the, the hints that, that Paroma and, and, and June was mentioning before, right? The sort of efficiencies of how we use users, right? The, the, the developers is is fundamental, right? One, one of the projects we are looking at is to um, um, imagine you start with semantically annotated data. I'm not going to give you the context. There are lots of places where, where we do have data for which we know that this column is not a string it is a, an address and is like the destination address of a of, of a shipment for example um i can then associate a lot of uh cleaning function validation functions udf even models right to that semantic type right uh what is the value there one of course we write the code once right and and anyone else who has like an address can now reuse the same functions two by have centralized this code it also means that if we realize we made a mistake uh, and, you know, we were treating addresses in a way that like works for U.S. addresses, but not for Canadian addresses. Now we can fix that cleaning function or that whatever model that we have. And now everyone who was using it can now quickly and, and naturally have it. Right. So uh, it, it's almost like a, a better anchor point. Right. Instead of saying this function is applied to this file, uh, we're working on a project where we say this function applied to this logical semantic type. Right? And then you are separately annotating this file to have this logical semantic type for a certain column or combination of columns. Right? And then you, you can sort of uh, factor out a lot of the work and, and, and create sort of a, um, a flywheel effect right? between multiple data scientists kind of collaborating more and more effectively. Uh, and I think this is a, a little bit hints towards also what, what June was saying, right? You, know, you, you start making it a little easier uh, you know, to, to, to be responsible about things, right? That there could be like a, someone who, who reviews a smaller amount of code and says, hey, this is not the right way to do, right? Or you can annotate some uh, column as in like, you know, you shouldn't be using these columns in this context, right? You do not have, do not have the legal right to use this personal information into, in, to train this model, right? Uh, and, and so over, overall, having this like a layer on top of the basic CSVs, if you want, that just give you the semantics of the data could enable a, a few of these like uh, more effective use of user and, and, and more responsible um, AI on top. It's not, not published yet. We'll 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 get to it to write this this, this work soon. I, I really uh, I think it's in, a super interesting concept which links back to uh, Paruma actually in Snorkel. I remember that you also had kind of just abstract features and let people write their labeling functions on top of it, right? Yeah, yeah, but that was right. <laughs> Thanks for remembering. No, but, and it's a nice evolution now into a broader space potentially. And I believe in Snorkel you do the same with labeling functions, slicing functions, and essentially multiple things that reside on those top higher level feature abstractions. Yeah, I think you know, kind of relying on those higher level features and making things as generalizable as possible instead of just focusing on you know yeah. one column from the machine learning perspective, just looking at like one data point at a time. As as soon as we can start kind of you know increasing sort of the base at which these functions work at, and then have algorithms or systems in place to denoise, take care of you know any of the um, incorrect uh, assumptions they might be making, that's a great way of, of taking advantage of um, using human time more efficiently. So Chris has a fun question, but before that, Mohammed had his hand up. Mohammed, feel free to pitch in. Uh, hello, uh, this is Mohammed Mokbel from University of Minnesota, connecting virtually from my business office in Minnesota. Uh, so uh, one thing I wanna think of uh, is going back to the history, we all benefit from having something like Postgres. It was system R like open source system that helped us understand the architectural database, train our students, we tell our students, go to Postgres, do your join, do your new algorithm. And this is how can we scale the analysis queries that was there, like SBJ, select object join, basically answer analysis queries. This is at the end of the day. So coming back now, Machine learning is still analysis query. I'm sure that if we dig in, there are a lot of things that can be abstracted. The way that regression analysis um, access, uh, access pages seem like different kind of regression, different kinds of machine learning techniques. However, we do not have this kind of unified architecture same like what we have in Bostigris. Uh, with Bostigris, you can build other open source systems. I would love to see this kind of unified architecture and open source systems that I can use or my students can use, or we can test the next generation of it. Uh, it's also side product of honestly, very successful startups because everyone now builds something, make a successful startup and forget doing 
commensal system for other people. So we kind of got lost here. Any hope from this? Do you want to take that? Because that's very related to what you were talking about. Let's dethrone TensorFlow and PyTorch. <laughs> Build a new Postgres of ML systems. What is that going to look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, Mohammed, I, I agree with what you're saying. And actually, it sort of, you know, goes into what I'm posting. I mean, like, in a sense, like, I, I don't want to sound harsh, but it sounds a little disappointing. I mean, people are, like, happy being relegated to the systems that run on top of these ML systems, right? Like, I, I think I think this is a mistake. I think that as a an, as a research area, we have a lot to offer, right? Like TensorFlow and PyTorch are terrible systems. Like, why do we assume that these are okay? They are right? not Maybe we're, we're ne what's that? They are not systems. They are algorithms. Yeah, they're just yeah, they're they're just terrible. And yeah. and to just like nibble around the edges, I think is a a practical mistake. I mean, okay, so maybe we can never actually, you know, dethrone these systems, but, but, but this is a research community. I mean, we should be asking, like, what is wrong with, with PyTorch and TensorFlow? And, and there are a lot of things wrong, right? Like, I don't want to get into it right now, but they're terrible systems. Like, I just feel like, yeah, we need to be ambitious, right? Or we're going to just be relegated to the, the, yeah, like an afterthought. I mean, OK, I'm going to I'm going to go and disagree with you again, just for spice things up. I, I mostly agree with your message, but I'm going to disagree so that I can we can spice it up a bit. So there's no chance you're going to throw them. The amount of money, engineering resources, hardware thrown at the system, it's beyond belief. So by the time we invent a better system, they would have fixed enough of their quirks that the new better system is relevant. Now, let me let me be a little less controversial now and, and agree with you a little bit. Um, underneath, I don't think this, this system should be surfaced, right? I, I, I remember some of your presentations, right? I think you have a very, very good point about like, you know, providing better abstraction, better way of thinking about system. We can optimize them later. But I think a, a, a valid way to go about it is to leverage what they're doing. So there's one very good thing that they're doing, right? They're taking one abstraction, you like it or not, this matrix multiply and, and operations. And they're mapping them underneath to a bizarre number of hardware. They're building compilers. They're building a huge amount of technology that will make those things go super fast. Now, let's build on top of it at first, and then in it, whatever crazy optimization we want. That surface is terrible. We shouldn't use it as it is, right? Um, but going against, like, say, let's let's rebuild our own is, is, is just a, a bit, um, uh, what's the name of the character? The fights against the the, the windmills, right? Um, I, I I wouldn't go after it straight donkey on. Shot. Uh, donkey shot. Donkey uh, shot. With Sancho. With Sancho. I don't know how much I agree with that. I mean, just to, to kind of argue against it and and give researchers maybe some hope. Like, yeah, I think if you just try to like replicate TensorFlow and you know but, but maybe tweak a few things, you're gonna have a hard time because they can do those like someone asked in the chat you know what happened to all the you know all the systems like mxnet and so on that tried to do that and you know they, they didn't really win but the way you these things usually get replaced is if there's a shift in the underlying dynamics like for example different class of users you, your thing targets a different class of users who could never use tensorflow and then they become the majority and then even the ml engineers who hacked around in tensorflow will prefer using your thing instead um, so either that or like, you know, different type of models or something like that, that everyone adopts. So that's what I would look for. Like, what's the qualitative difference of what you're doing? Um, if you just try to make like a slightly faster, you know, TensorFlow, then it, it will be a nice research paper. It, and maybe that team will like look at it and implement it. But you know. I mean, just, just to be really concrete, right? Like people are moving to multi billion parameter models and multi-trillion parameter models are around the corner. Now, not everyone's yeah. going to do that. But the fact is, if I want to use TensorFlow on more than one GPU, I'm effectively ending up writing my own distributed matrix multiply. It's ridiculous, yeah, right? That's, that's a good one. So Chris, 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 and Mate. So one thing here is there's the techniques, and then there's the vehicle. I see TensorFlow and PyTorch as vehicles. Techniques can be achieved on these vehicles. That's what we are showing in our project at Cerebro as well. All the scalability issues we're talking about can actually be addressed 
without needing to modify the TensorFlow abstraction. If that is possible, is there enough buy-in for a completely disjoint system that offers the same benefits, but asks users to do major surgery to their interface? Or so, is there a way to keep the interface, but just still do major surgery anyway? So here's one thought related to what Arun is saying. And I know, I mean, we, we have this, uh, this gathering uh, themed around systems and ML, but um, but if you, I mean, this is VLDB, right? So, so uh, you know, what about DB and ML? I mean, the reason I'm thinking about this is there are a lot of people who are interested in basically applying machine learning techniques to DB, right? And then there are a lot of us who think that DB has a lot to contribute to ML, right? So, and and DB is a is a system that's fairly stable, it has very long staying power, right? It's not like SQL is going away anywhere soon. Um, now, what would be the idea of let's just you know eat our own dog food, right? You know, we think we can do something for ML. What what if we build? Um, what if we apply our DB techniques for ML, but for the purpose of helping DB, which then you know helps ML, which then helps DB. You know, um, you know, apply your clean closure there, right? So, what if uh, is there a, a a place for a system that's uh, that's the DB and ML come so synergistically together, you can't really break them apart. Uh, yet at the same time, it offers, I mean, we're not trying to invent a, a new interface or anything like that, or, or be out there competing with other, um, uh, you know, other, other classes of users. But is there opportunity for some, you know, innovation here? So, so Jun, there is a paper that we have from our group, again, from the Cerebral Project at VLDB, which is tomorrow where we collaborate with the Madlib folks, right? These are the folks that pushed ML into DBMS for a decade with UDFs and stuff. The latest trend is to plug in TensorFlow as a UDF specification engine. So now you have your training specified in your TensorFlow or even your PyTorch computational graphs, the same SGD routines. The data is managed by the DBMS and it's executed by the DBMS. And then the lakehouse paradigm that Databricks is pushing also fits with that. The data can be governed and stored and managed by a DBMS but the ML specification and execution can be orchestrated and fronted by a separate tool that's not the SQL layer. So it bypasses the SQL stack. It just goes directly to the physical files. It could go directly through the physical operators. It can bypass the logical operator. So there's a lot of in-between space between this fully in DBMS and fully out of DBMS. And we've shown that there is a whole spectrum there with different Pareto trade-offs. I think the focus on building the efficient system stuff is sort of, a type of what the database community is about. And so that's why you're seeing a lot of these conversations. But I think all the points that were made about ML monitoring and the policy issues and the data centric programming issues for ML is all showing that DB ideas for ML is so much larger than building the execution engines, right? So right. this point that we made, which you said, bring DB ideas to ML thing, kind of, that's what I've been calling DBification of ML. And we don't need to just consign ourselves to DBMSs or data processes. Absolutely. We can view TensorFlow or PyTorch also as a DBMS. We could view even Scikit-learn as a DBMS if we want. I mean, I was making a point at CIDR that Pandas can be viewed as a DBMS. So we could, if we bring that lens, we can see it anywhere we want. And then we could, what are the philosophies and principles and techniques that have helped the RDBMS world? Can they help these other worlds as well? I think. People are starting to understand that that is helpful. So like Keras was absorbed in TensorFlow, right? The hierarchies of specification layers, that's sort of one of the nice things, right? The declarativity, the higher level specification, automated translation and so on. So I think we are seeing that happen. But one concern I have that I would like you all to weigh in, ML folks are very wishy-washy. They're very fungible. They don't care about exactness as much as we do. They're not logically grounded. They don't care about exact results as much as we do. Whereas in SQL query land, you want the results to be exact. <laughs> There's approximate queries and such, but most people are so grounded in this exact worldview. ML people are like, I don't care if I can modify my model this way, that way, as long as the accuracy is similar, I don't care. Is there a big culture gap here? Like Mate, you were saying production friendly ML, right? So Mate is going to give a talk at the SDS session tomorrow. If we do drop by that and check it out. What do you think about this, Mate? So ML folks look at data systems and then they think, we don't need to be that exact. We can just do something that's quick and dirty, that's hacky. As long as we get our application business goals met, I don't care what system we use. I think it really depends on whether they're, 
in industry with like, you know, this is part of their job to make it work versus they're at an early stage of experimenting or, you know, they're just in grad school and they're trying to get a paper. So if you're in industry and you you get paged in the middle of the night when your thing breaks, uh, you're, you're going to have a different perspective. Um, and it's a gap. Unfortunately, it's hard to really experience that and and get a sense of it from a university. Maybe if you find like a colleague who's, you know, who, who, who's working, who's trying to use ML like for something, let's say in whatever science or medicine or something, you'd get some perspective, but yeah, but there is a gap and it is hard to understand. Yeah. I think it's more proportional to the, the so in, in databases, we assume that any bit flip, right? Any tuple that is not part of an answer is, is, is equally bad, right? I think in machine learning, there's a graduation. It's a much more smooth of a curve, right? Um, like if you look at Bing uh, monetization pipelines and the ad placements, right, they care about like 75 digits past the zero where, where, where there's been a bit flip anywhere, right? So you, you can't do even super uh, compiler light techniques. They're really skeptical about even those because there's like, it, it's possible there is a tail end advertisement that will be placed wrong and we don't want to make a mistake there, right? Um, obviously, if you're in, in a scenario where like the dollar amounts of, of a mistakes are, are much lower and et cetera, Eh, it's 90, 92% accuracy is just, just as well, right? And and then I think it's just a smoother curve. I agree with Matei that at the high end, um, the, I think the, the, the level of paranoia is probably comparable to database people, um, but there's a lot more, a, a broader range. Yeah. And it, 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 is, it is non-deterministic, which is different. So, and it's a lot harder to, mm -hmm. even to know whether it's working well. So. That's true. So Parama, what is your sense from what you're seeing with the uh, Snorkel customers? Because you are going all the way. You're like, even the label data doesn't need to be exact. Just specify approximate heuristics and the machine will learn something from it. What, what, what is the response from say the banks and the retail companies who have traditionally been very conservative adopters of software? And I think this this kind of goes back to the point I was making about using human time efficiently, right? I think if we had given them a system where we say, put in your data and we'll just give you a beautifully wrapped uh, ML package that you can put in production, I don't think they would have been okay with it, right? I think what really makes them excited is the fact that they get to see exactly what's happening at each and every single step of the pipeline when they're building out these ML systems even though each step might not be exact, right? And I think this is actually a great opportunity for research. And, you know, that's how we got started too, of looking at how we could take things that weren't perfect, had imperfections, right? In this case, it was how we were assigning labels to training data and then use an algorithm in the back end to kind of refine it. Will it get refined all the way? No, but I think the system has the ability, um, you know, taking advantage of machine learning and generalization to be able to correct those errors. And whenever we use machine learning, right? I, I think one thing that everyone understands is it's not going to be perfect 100% of the time. It's an understanding exactly what subsets of data you need it to be really, really accurate for, which ones you have a little more leeway on and kind of encoding those biases and preferences back into the system, which you can do you know, easily through the data. You can do it at a higher level of abstraction again. Um, going back to like a point that Matei made in the chat, right? Um, a few years ago, you know, machine learning was something that was reserved just for people who were doing research in ML, had PhDs, were working in industry in ML groups. And now with Snorkel and other systems out there, the idea is we can kind of bring this power essentially to people who aren't technical, who don't come from machine learning. So capturing that right level of abstraction, making sure the power stays with those domain experts to kind of specify exactly what they care about while training these complex ML models. I think that's really interesting. And the more we can do to raise that level of abstraction, uh, the better it is. Sounds great. So we have some lively chat going on. That's awesome, keep continuing. One, I think we are almost out of time. So one last thing would be about students. And Carlo and Chris and I had a chat about diversity in the database community and how do we get more students from underrepresented groups? The AI community has done very well with Black in AI, women in AI, Latinx in AI, LGBT in queer in AI, so many things. The DB community has just started this last year, the DB DNI initiative and the DNI chairs. I was there for Sigmod last, uh, last Sigmod. Um, is there something we can do to ride on the coattails of the success of the AI community? to attract students from all sorts of backgrounds into the DB community. I mean, this is this area, right? Systems for ML, 
should be an area that should be attractive to students who are interested in ML but want to build systems and build practical, solve practical problems and do research that has an impact on practitioners rather than just doing ad hoc algorithms and publishing a gazillion New York's papers. What do the panelists think about? What do the panelists think about that? How do we attract those sorts of students? Like, can the community do something more to make this area more attractive? Or are we already doing the right thing already? And so you just have to keep continuing and over time, maybe things will improve. So, sir, Sebastian, Jun, Matthias, Matei, Chris, you're all academics. How do you so find that? You find students who are interested in databases and then make them work on ML stuff, or do you find ML students and make them work on database stuff? So I don't have any great advice, but what works relatively well for our group <clears throat> is to really work on the entire stack. Because often students, especially at bachelor master level, they don't really know what concrete research project they want to work with. They know you from a lecture, they like that you're excited, they want to write your, your, their thesis with you. And then what helps is really being able to pitch a real diversity of projects such that you fit different persons in the infrastructure of debugging, monitoring, data validation, or hardcore hardware accelerators. So there it helps actually building, like uh, Chris said, um, a system from scratch and building really building it up. But yeah, no good advice. So. Yeah, I would say I, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but I, I do think for you know students from an underrepresented background who are interested in computer science and maybe a research career, I think there are a lot of good reasons to go into systems and databases as opposed to um, AI directly because um, it, there's just basically like so many people are going for AI and it's it's very crowded and in, in these other spaces you can uh, more easily have impact and I think do you know do really interesting research so usually when I talk with students like that you know they, they do get excited about these topics um, but it's I think it's important to figure out what's exciting to them and and to have ways where they can learn about this all along their career path. Like, you know, a lot of students say like, I, you know, I didn't even consider doing a PhD or whatever. So they should, they should consider that. That makes a lot of sense. That's actually also what I use it for my sales pitch to the students that I interview, which is like the AI community is overcrowded and overrun, and especially overrun with giant industry labs. The DB community and systems community are still kind of reasonably sized. And I think the systems community is actually shrinking. DB community has been stable for the last half a decade. So I don't know. One other thing I was thinking is should we have a, these venues at the commission. You ran Deem at Sigma for years. Is there a counterpart that we can run at these ML venues where the DB and systems folks go there and kind of advertise our work and attract people from there? Uh, that's a very that's a very good question. So Andrew Ng is now starting this initiative on data centric AI, and I think they will have a workshop at Nurips this year, and. Um, um, I think they published their call for papers um, this week or so, and they are looking for position papers. So maybe that could um, be an, an interesting opportunity for us to pitch their work there, because I, I also have the feeling that they might not be too aware of too much of our work and that they might um, work on reinventing some of the things that we've already done. I see. I, be, I believe there's Max Schleich on the call. He also uh, is involved in a, in a oh, Max AI and a workshop at New Rips. That's right. You have a workshop Thank you for the. <laughs> That's exactly right. So we are organizing a DBAI workshop in New Rips, and we would love to have contributions and attendees and uh, um, however else you would like to participate. Please feel free to reach out. I'll post a link in the chat. So I, I, I want to bring back a little bit to what Arun was saying, right? So Arun was not just saying like, how do we get AI people to work in databases, right? I think it was also point, at least our conversation initially was was also around the fact that like the diversity and, and I think the inclusion, the inclusivity of our community is not good, right? And the hypothesis was that in, in AI, more things are happening, right? You have like black in AI, women in AI, like, you know, Latins and, you know, LGBTQ, et cetera. So there's, there seems to be either just by the nature of being a larger community, uh, there's more uh, enough people that they kind of coalesce in, in ways. Uh, but in general, I think our, our community is not nearly inclusive enough, right? Um, my argument, my, my angle in general is, is 
you don't do diversity by just like you know uh, paying uh, you know airfare for a lot more women to to come or a lot more you know uh, people from other uh, underrepresented groups right and then having like a shitty macho terrible experience uh, when they come right because now 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 there's successfully many more people that know how terrible of a community we are right uh, so so I think what, what we need to do is to is to invest on on being uh, more inclusive right so we've we've been doing it in in the uh, you know with the DB and the in, in, in AI it's like DB and the I initiatives uh we've been doing it with you know at, at a few conferences of, we've been involved in it as like a um dni chairs with a series of activities but i think that's that's the work to be done right and honestly i don't particularly care how big is the database community the bigger the better obviously but you know if we stay the same i'm, I'm super happy but i would like to see us be much more representative of, of the populations that we have right because otherwise all of the responsible ai responsible data management that the June was, was was pointing out we're not going to do it right because we just don't see the problems, right? Um, that's one true. thing I think that definitely helps is um, um, have more mentoring, right? Um, but I think ultimately what it comes down to is um, we have to kind of reward people for what they do, right? If they, they promote diversity, how, how is that? How is our community actually rewarding these efforts? Um, it's not clear, right? So because when, when we look at basically contributions and, and, and so on, it's uh, a lot of times still comes down to, you know, whether you're paper getting and then so on and so forth. And uh, I feel like there needs to be some interest alignment on, at that level so that, uh, you know, people's time are actually rewarded. Um, I think one, one thing I would add, Carlo, is over the last two, three years, I wrote a blog post about this, right? The Sigma VLDB PC process has improved so much. I think the reviews have become more civil, there's more policing, there's more guidelines, it's still a ways to go. Like four years ago when I wrote the first blog post about culture wars, it was really, really nasty. We had terms like marketing BS and stuff floating around in reviews. I think the community has taken that part seriously. I think um, it, it kind of has a ripple effect. If students see reviews that are overly nasty, that are not technically focused, it will obviously drive people away. I think that is something that people did recognize and they're starting to address. That is encouraging for me to see, but we have a lot more to do. And I mean, I guess academics, we have the opportunity to go and meet all these students from high schools and others and kind of convince them to come to our community rather than go to another 10X larger community that is drowning with industry money, I guess. Yeah, but I like a lot uh, June's comments, right? Like what, is, you know, we need to set up um you know um reward systems right that 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 get people to do the right thing right because i mean and if you think about it right what is the best paper award i mean it's, it's a completely fabricated thing right we sit together and we says like let's create one more award right and it makes people happy it may get people recognized but it's just us deciding that this thing is a, is a thing right so i think we could probably do an equal uh, an equal set of uh, sort of um community recognitions moments right that can push in that direction, right? Because uh, otherwise, you know, if the only thing you're evaluated on is your number of papers and how many best paper awards, I mean, the the, the incentive is is don't care how I get it done, let's just get it done, right? And and people get very cutthroat and like you know they don't think about anything else except like you know yes, but this will give me more papers, right? Uh, so I I think we should we should create more uh, more incentives. I think it's a fantastic idea, Jun. It's great. I'm glad we the community is having these conversations. So we are out of time. Chris, did you have anything else to add? Thank you again to all the panelists for showing up. It was a pleasure having you all. And thank you to all the audience for showing up and also participating in the discussion. Over to yeah, you, just thanks to everyone for coming. And thanks to the, yeah, the panelists, the audience. Uh -huh. Yeah. Great. I think this is recorded. So the volunteers will make it available on Hoover for the other VLDP attendees to view it. So it was nice catching up with you all. Thanks, folks, for showing up. Take care. Enjoy VLDP. Bye. Bye.